all so much for coming out tonight. Thank you for staying past what time you've given to your jobs to be here. I really appreciate it. And we're up. Um, I want to thank you, or thank Designers and Geeks for having me. I really want to thank Danielle and Women Talk Design for giving speakers like me, empowering speakers like me with opportunities like these. When Danielle reached out and said that tonight's theme would be something like designing for access, I immediately said yes. I have been spending a lot of time over the past year and some change thinking about access as it pertains to fair and ethical AI, um, but also ethical design. But then I started looking through my notes and really thinking about what I might talk about tonight. And I just couldn't get excited about data. I couldn't get excited about machine learning. I've been on maternity leave with a tiny human. And so what I really wanted to do tonight was focus in on people and stories about people. And so what I did was I went through my kind of assorted other experiences and I dug around and I thought about when I had last worked to enact or give and grant access in a service design capacity. And what I found actually surprised me. So in late summer of 2008, I moved to New York City to go to grad school. And in high school and throughout college, I had worked in restaurants and in fine dining capacities. Um, and so when I got there as a grad student, I knew I would need some money in my pocket. And so what I wanted to do was apply to, of course, the best restaurant in town that at the time was Thomas Keller's Per Se, um, which was at the time uh, number six of restaurants in the world and was number one restaurant in New York. Oh, cool. We, look, we got a Laurel and Hardy thing type going on, so it's good. Um, and to my surprise, they called me back. And I did an extensive interview, I did a power day, and I eventually got the job. Now, you all might be wondering what in the world I could be saying about access when I'm also talking about designing for one of the most exclusive experiences in the world. But what I want to do tonight is actually democratize some of the things that we used in play every night to create these wonderful and remarkable experiences, to uh, have people at their kind of most excited, right? To have them there when they're uh, there for, whether it be birthdays or anniversaries or even memorials. Um, and you know the fact that they chose to spend their hard-earned money with us and spend three hours, we took that responsibility so seriously. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is kind of share four points that I've kind of distilled all of my knowledge from per se um, down into and share it with all of you that you might use it in designing experiences um, that grant more access. Those four points are gonna be around trust and establishing trust, transparency, around humility and serving with humility, and finally, around supporting one another and being good to one another. Sound good? Awesome. All right. <laughs> I'm just rolling with it. Um, <laughs> that's OK. Yes. Here's the part where I'm just out of material. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so the picture that we'll show behind me at some point or another um, is the actual dining room at Per Se. Um, this first point around trust, I'm going to anchor, and I'm going to say it's anchored in two things, and engendering trust in your users or your guests or your customers. We did this in two very fundamental ways at Per Se. One is personalization, and I'd say that personalization ties and has a lot of tie into equity and building building equity, making sure that people get what they need. And then also, we found these profound moments of trust building. So not just, there's many moments and opportunities for you to engender trust with your users or customers or guests, but we found the really, we found and optimized for the most profound. So the first story I'll tell is actually one where I'm gonna set the scene of what it's like to actually eat it per se. So first of all, there's only 16 tables, that's it. There's two seatings a night, one at 5.30 and one at 9.30. And when you walk in, if you're a first time guest, we will welcome you as a new friend or family member. If you're somebody who's dined with us before, there's a high likelihood that we meet you at that door and we welcome you by saying your first name, by welcoming you in, by remembering something about you from the last time you were with us, even if that was years before. 
Once you get to your table, especially if you're a repeat customer, if you're a friend or family member of the staff, if you are a member of the industry, you've never been in before, but you work in the restaurant business, you'll arrive to your table to a handwritten note from Chef Keller himself or the chef de cuisine that says, thank you so much for choosing to spend your time with us. Then the captain um, of your table will come over. He or she will greet you, will walk you through how the evening is going to go, will take your drink order, and of course, will go through the entire menu with you. Now, this is the part that's really special. This is the part where your menu arrives at the table. It's not just there when you arrive. It doesn't come out in the first couple of seconds. Minutes into the experience, your personalized menu arrives. If you're there celebrating a special occasion, guess what's printed at the top of the menu? Happy birthday. We're so excited that you're here with us. Um, a little bit of a note, um, as somebody who is a host, my favorite thing to do would be we'd be escorting a group to the table, and I'd hear somebody mention that it was somebody's birthday, but we didn't necessarily know that in advance. It was my job to, as gracefully as possible, escort people to the table, wish them a great evening, as gracefully as possible, uh, find my way to the service pathways. And then, of course, the panic began where I said, it's Margie's 80th birthday, and we need to print a menu by the time it is time for her to receive it. And we would do that. Um, these wonderful kind of personalized experiences meant that people knew that they were choosing wisely. They were placing their trust with us, and we were there making sure at every turn that they got what they needed, even down to what was on their menu. If in advance you told us you had a dietary restriction or food allergy, you didn't see what you couldn't or didn't want to eat on your menu. We'd already made substitutions for you for each individualized guest, and your captain would walk the entire table through what you'd receive. Second, that kind of bit about trust, right? And kind of finding those profound moments of trust. Of course, we had opportunities throughout the booking experience as you walked in to engender trust. But one night, um, or I guess I'll back up and say, right at about this vantage point, as you were entering the dining room, all of the available staff would kind of size up what size of table was coming in to be seated. And the exact amount of staff would meet each and every guest at their own chair, and in a one-to-one -one ratio, would help guests to, into their seat. And on my way back to the hostess stand one night, my director of operations, Raj, said to me, do you know how important that orchestration is? And I shrugged. I was like, it's a cool, grand thing that we do. <laughs> we help people into their chairs. And he said, no, that's the first physical interaction of these guests with our hospitality. It's the first moment where a guest says, I am going to sit now. Will you catch me if I fall? And we say, don't worry. We've got you. Come be here a while. It's a mini trust fall. That, for me, was so important. It gives me goosebumps even now thinking about it. We have all these moments where, of course, we were building trust, but that one was so important. So the second key I'll point out is that of transparency. Um, transparency is so important internally and externally, especially where there are policies that might generate friction. Dress codes. We had one. It was a jacket required situation. Now, some people love that, some people hate that. I am going to give a controversial disclaimer and say, I love it. We were creating an experience for you that was special. We wanted somebody to arrive and be dressed to receive that special experience. Now, if somebody arrived and they didn't have a jacket, what we would do at the very front is we would take your, your coat, generally, especially in winter and spring, we'd take your large coat, and we'd put it in the coat uh, room, and then we would come back with the best guesstimate of size on a jacket that we had in our store of jackets, and we would seamlessly offer them. Now, some people would take the jacket. Some people would immediately refuse. Some people would put the jacket on, take it off at the table. We didn't really care. What was important is that we, as a staff, were bonded in our decision to enforce that policy. Enforce is such a charged word, but to um, aspire every guest to meet that policy. And ultimately, that was what we were bonded in. Now, I think transparency is an important point to circle on here. I find that a lot of my really wonderful and talented friends are currently at companies where the policies might be causing friction with users, right? Um, whether that be because there are ethical concerns with their platforms, et cetera. 
I think I've heard in the design community that there are some people who say, then just quit your job and walk away. Not all of us have that privilege. And so what I say then is, how might you have more transparency with one another internally to discuss those policies? And as much as you possibly can, push your organizations to speak externally about why the business case is that you're keeping with a certain policy. I love the intensity in this picture. This is pretty much the intensity of every night of every staff member at Per Se. Um, I will say that kind of this point here is actually around the humility that I think is actually captured in this photo. Uh, humility is so key to enacting experiences and making sure that there's a path to access. And I say that because at Per Se, what we were doing is we were effectively translating where we were kind of customer facing job roles, right? We were translating high art, which is what the food looked like, all the way down into really enjoyable, savorable morsels, things that really connected with people on a human level. One of Thomas Keller's most famous dishes is a thing called coffee and donuts because he loves and just resonated with him coffee and donuts as a child and wanted to bring that into this high art form. And so I must say that we must all kind of strive for that humility and that humbleness. Um, each and every night at Per Se, before we would open the doors, we would have some of the toughest meetings of my life where the chef would go through. It didn't matter if you were a host, if you were a sommelier, or if you were a captain, and he would painstakingly go through every single menu item and ask one of us, pop quiz style, what a thing was and to explain it. It was, the, it was the, on, the weight on all of our shoulders to participate in that. And I think that humility, that learning disposition, so that when we heard a guest inevitably say, what's a seckle pear? We could say, oh, it's a tiny little pear that Nancy and Tom grow in upstate New York, and we've chosen them because of the sugar content, and they're paired in this dish in this way. Translating, again, that high art into something that was really approachable, really exciting, um, and really kind of granting them access to that experience. The final point I'll make is one about support. And this is the support that was entirely backstage. It was the support that we generated internally, and I think it's so important uh, to, the way, to the work that we all do today. Um, we used to engage in a thing called family and staff meal. And I don't know how many of you have heard this before, but it is true, the way that people really connect with one another, the best way to engender trust amongst a group of people working together is to just simply break bread, to eat a meal. And so every night we had that routine. We ate well, we didn't just eat cheese sandwiches. I've worked at a catering job that did just that. Um, we ate decadently, we ate well, we broke bread together. There, that meant even blood sugar, that meant revelry, that meant inside jokes, that meant that we could all kind of suit up for battle to do a very hard thing every night. The second thing I'll say that we did in a way that we supported one another and we were supported by the organization itself is that we had spaces that were designated backstage for just staff. So that story that I told earlier about finding out that it was somebody's birthday, all on the floor that people saw was this wonderful dance. And actually at the opening of Per Se, Thomas Keller had everybody participate in ballroom dance lessons. All that people see on the dance floor is this wonderfully orchestrated experience where no one is rushing, everybody is just moving at the same speed. But behind the scenes, we had these corridors and spaces where we could modulate the speed of service, where we could honestly freak the fuck out, where we could do whatever we needed to do to operate at the level that we needed to operate in. And I think about support because the, what we're designing in many given you know, instances, for me particularly for financial inclusion, it's a hard, it's a tough, it's a rough thing. Sometimes my company might make calls that I don't agree with. Sometimes they may, might be slow to make calls that I want them to. Having these moments of breaking bread with my team, of knowing that we're in this together, of having moments where we have kind of design jams or private spaces for one another um, so that we can dig into this before we kind of start to uh, develop for front stage or kind of customer facing experiences is really important to me. So I'll end on this note and say that humanity is at a really interesting inflection point right now with technology. And we can either choose at this point to redesign the world as we know it, 
Or what we can do is we can start to articulate more bold, more interesting, uh, newer, better, more equitable futures. And I believe that trust, that humility, that transparency, and that supporting one another is key and foundational to all of that. Trust endears our customers to us, it endears us to one another. Transparency and humility mean that we're letting always a little bit of light shine in on the experience. We're always able to see the outside world, to see the greater context within which our experiences or our applications live, right? And finally, being good to one another is always a good idea because if we're good to one another, we can do great things together. Thank you.